Hello and Happy New Year. Thank you to everyone joining us today from across the country and around the world. I'm Queenie Potis, Partner Success Manager here at CCI. And on behalf of the entire Conscious Capitalism team, we appreciate you taking the time to learn and grow with us in community. Conscious Capitalism Inc. is a nonprofit organization dedicated to catalyzing the movement by creating learning opportunities like today's session and building systems of support for practicing conscious capitalists. Through interactive programming in our senior leader network, engagement in your local region through our chapters, and in person events like our CEO Summit. As many of you know, conscious capitalism is a philosophy that emphasizes the human nature of business as well as a movement of business leaders from around the world working to change the practice and perception of capitalism as a means to elevate humanity. Several times a month, we offer virtual gatherings as a way for the community to see how this philosophy takes shape in the leadership journeys and the business practices of those in our network. Today, we are excited to welcome Rob Connolly, CEO and Chairman of Henny Penny and Senior Leader Network member to discuss having a long view approach to conscious culture and leadership. Today's gathering will run for about 45 minutes. We will be in our conversation with Rob for about 30 of those minutes and then transition to the audience for questions for the last 10 to 15 minutes. We do have a new thing that we're starting here on the virtual gathering space and we're opening up our chat. Um, so please feel free to welcome yourself and tell us where you're from, who you are, and where you're calling from. We'd love to hear from you. Please feel free to use the Q&A box, however, at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get to as many of your questions at the end as we can during our time together. If you're having technical issues, please email us at info at consciouscapitalism.org, and one of our team members will be there to assist but the session will also be recorded and will be available on our website under the events page. Without further ado, I'm honored to introduce Rob Connolly. Rob, <laughs> as mentioned, Rob is chairman and CEO of the employee owned Henny Penny Corporation, headquartered in Eaton, Ohio. Rob began his career at Henny Penny as Vice President of Marketing in 2005, then to President in 2007, as when, and was named CEO in 2014, and has served as Chairman of the Board Members, or sorry, Chairman of the Board of Directors since 2020. Before joining Henny Penny, he held several key leadership roles at Verifone. Committed to upholding and advancing the vision and values on which the company has built, Rob is passionate about making a significant positive impact on the company's employee owners, its community, and its customers. He has carried forward the Henny Penny ethos that companies have an opportunity and a responsibility that extends beyond simply being an employer. A conscious leader, Rob's servant leadership style centers on cultivating growth and creating impact by supporting the company's employee owners. Rob serves on the Board of Directors of the North American Association of Food Equipment Manufacturers, the Board of Trustees at both Sinclair Community College and Dayton Children's Hospital, and also serves as a board member of Shook Construction and Mile 2. He's previously served on other boards, uh, such as the Dayton Art Institute, Dayton History, and the Cox Arboretum uh, Foundation. I've had the honor to meet and get to know Rob at the CEO summits and learn from his leadership, as well as to see so many different accolades of Penny Penny's success as an organization, both at your headquarters and globally. And I'm really excited to talk about that. So I'm personally excited to be able to share your insights with our community today. And I know you're traveling all the time, Rob. So welcome. How are you? Oh, thanks, Queenie. Well, that was the most uncomfortable part of this. So we can get on to talking about <laughs> fun things like Penny Penny and, and uh, you know, and I, I also just think of like, I'm not sure how many of the folks that are uh, listening in are, are part of the conscious capitalism. Um, I feel so uh, fortunate to be part of that community of where we're just all on this journey and, and sharing and, and I see this is just part of that. And if, if there are people that aren't really familiar with conscious capitalism, um, you really should. And I'd say it, it can start with, you can 
go on Amazon right now and look up conscious capitalism. And there's a book that John Mackey wrote. And I'd start with that and uh, and get involved because it's it's a really cool organization. And you'll find a lot of people that are just trying to uh, do business better and impact more people positively. So I I uh, do that if you're not. And and so anyway, I'm uh, thanks Queenie. Thanks for having me and uh, uh, excited to be here. That's awesome. Thank you for that. And yes, that yellow book is our signature piece. And um, if you haven't learned about conscious capitalism before, please feel free uh, to email us as well to learn more. Um, but yeah, let's jump into to Henny Penny. Um, so obviously here at Conscious Capitalism, we know all about Henny Penny, you know, um, the organization and your leadership. But there might be some folks here with us today that aren't really familiar with the company. So can you just give us a little overview and tell us a little bit more about the operations at Henny Penny? Sure. It's um, it's kind of funny. And we've got a, a few slides that might just kind of be some visuals. But Henny Penny, uh, we're in our 66th year. Um, it's kind of funny, even with the name. Uh, the uh, the name is from the nursery rhyme uh, of Chicken Little and and uh, Henny Penny and Turkey Lurkey. And uh, um, the founder, uh, he invented uh, the pressure fryer which was used for the most part to make better fried chicken. It's not, that's the only thing, but, and so he wanted some whimsical name that was for, he had a young son and, and had been reading the nursery rhyme to him and came up with Henny Penny. Um, I think the name is kind of brilliant because for many people, even if you haven't heard of Henny Penny, they're like, I, it, it sounds familiar. They're not sure why. They're like, I think I ate there once or, or whatever. <laughs> and so it's, uh, but it's this uh, company. We're in the, we're in the heartland. We're in Ohio. Um, and uh, you can kind of see a little bit of the, the campus. We've got about uh, 75 acres. We've got um, about 1,200 people, employee owners. Um, we've got, uh, so we are a manufacturer. And um, and on the next slide, you can um, see a little bit about where we are. We have our um, our main campus is in Eaton, Ohio, which is outside. It's about 25 miles west of Dayton. Um, we then have a, a facility in Suzhou, China, where we do uh, manufacturing and sales and support. And that's mainly to extend our reach in Asia. We also have uh, sales and training and support in Paris, um, about 20 miles from uh, downtown Paris uh, East. And uh, we also have Bellingham, Washington, where we own Woodstone, which Woodstone is, uh, mm -hmm. they make the Hearthstone ovens that you might see in like California Pizza Kitchen. And they also make like the grills. If you go into a Chipotle, the grill that they're using, that is exclusively by Woodstone. So anyway, we're in Eaton, Ohio, Paris, Suzhou, and Bellingham. The names have probably never been linked before. <laughs> now they are. Um, and uh, we have about 100 uh, distributors around the world that, are, uh, that kind of represent us in, in our different countries. On the next slide, um, as far as what we do, we make um, we make pressure fryers, we make open fryers. You know, open frying is something that's about in every commercial kitchen in the world. Um, it's a very common form of cooking. We make ovens and and holding equipment and merchandisers, rotisseries. What I would say briefly about what we do is, if it were um, if it were like in the automobile business, we make buses. We make the world's best buses. So in our world, in food service, it would be for people that um, they do uh, food in high volume. And so if food is critical to your business and you do it in high volume, then that's who we are. And so um, a lot of people would look at our, our products and go like, wow, you are so expensive. And again, I would equate it to being like, well, we make a bus. So if you're moving 80 people, we are the most efficient, best way to do it. If you have four people, you ought to get a car. I mean, even if you can afford our bus, it wasn't made for that. And so that's, that's mm -hmm. where we go. And so we're, 
we're a lot of places that are doing very high volume. So we're helping them do it very consistently, very efficiently, very effectively. And here you can kind of see some of our customers of which you'll um, recognize most of them, I'm assuming. And, and uh, they are, um, and we're selling all over the world. And these are places that want to cook, want to cook, want to cook, want to cook. And to be able to do that consistently in high volume. And so, and we're also, because of that, we're kind of mission critical. So if our products go down, the restaurant is um, down and out of business. So we make a very reliable product and we spend a lot on making it very reliable, durable, and then have the support to get them back up if they're down. So anyway, that's a little bit about, and we're selling yeah, I think we're in over a hundred countries where our products are, and and uh, most of them are made right here in uh, Eaton, Ohio. I mean, seventy-five acres is a lot is a lot of space, so I know you have the the land to do that. And I was excited to see uh, Jolly Bee on on that last screen because that is um, native to the Philippines, and there is a couple around me. So I, you know, I think our audience now knows that whenever they go either to a fast food restaurant or have some fried chicken, that it was actually cooked in one of your, um, you know, one of your pieces. So that's yep, exciting. I've been, I've been with the folks from Jolly Bee. I've been uh, <laughs> in uh, the Philippines a number of times and they're, they're quite an operation. They're really, uh, it's a, it's a special group. That's amazing. Um, so the company has been around since 1957 and has never had to go through some layoffs. That was like a really uh, impactful piece of information. So, and in this day and age, it seems almost impossible. What do you equate and attribute to that kind of success? So it's it's a, a couple things. And, and I would start with this. There are a lot of very good companies that have great values that have had to had a layoff because they needed to rescale their business because their business changed. And I, so I'm not trying to like say, gosh, we're, we are um, like, like there could be a time when we would might have to, but what we've been is very intentional about um, having that be the last thing we ever do. Now, some companies, they do it more as a, a way of doing business because it's easy to manage costs and whatever by managing it through your people and adding and cutting. Now, I don't find that in our conscious capitalism community, but I would just say, you know, there are. And so I it would start with this. It's the last thing we would do. And you combine that with kind of the, the long view of being able to, uh, and to have the resources where we've also been conservative and making sure that we can weather something. And so I think it's a combination of being intentional about trying not to hire too fast, to be financially strong, and to be in a position where you can go over and, and maybe uh, withstand bumps without it coming out on your people. Mm -hmm. um, and now, and again, I would just reiterate, if if our business fundamentally changed and we lost a third of our business for some reason, and we saw that as an extended time, we would do what we need to do to protect the overall business and the, and the employees overall. So we, we wouldn't like go out of business uh, mm -hmm. on principle. <laughs> But but we've been very intentional about trying, and we've been fortunate to, uh, to make that all work. And so we're we're proud of that. But I also it's it's um, I feel we've been fortunate too. That's great. I mean, it's it's interesting to hear people first organizations and how they really support their employees, um, especially at times like we've experienced in the last two years. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, it's a two-part question. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about your core values at Henny Penny and give us some examples of how values show up at the company and how do you continue to focus on those core values of the company while working to maintain a profitable business? Yeah. So um, we've got, um, I think there's a slide that just is a visual as far as what we're doing. Um, you know, it, it starts with, I think, our overall journey is this, you know, we, we're trying to um, 
you know, really impact people positively and significantly. And, and that, that is our, our, our dream and what, what really drives us. How do we impact our people, our employee owners? How do we impact our community? And how do we do it by impacting our customers? And so we're really trying to impact people. And we do it by making sure, you know, that we have this thriving company that's a best place to work and grow. And, and then we also are focused on people's well-being and, and then also this journey that a special journey for us that not every company is on, and that's being employee-owned and what that means. So one of the things when it's really important to understand is the thriving company is so critical. You can't lose sight of the fact that you need to have a thriving business to make everything else possible. We can't have just an environment that's a, it's a great place to work and everything, but our business is declining because, and as a matter of fact, it can't be a best place to work and grow if your business is not thriving. It has to be thriving because a thriving business provides opportunities. It provides the resources. So the things we're able to do and that we are financially strong and we can invest in the long view and we can invest in our facilities and we can invest in our people starts with the fact that we've got a thriving business. So number one for everybody, it's like you can't lose sight of you, the business has to perform. Um, now, within that, when we're saying like, OK, making that real and what we talk about every day would be like, how do we take care? You know, there's kind of three areas that are right there that are are about how are we taking care of each other, how are we taking care of our customers, and how are we taking care of the community? And how that came about is a, a real life example, because I think one of the things we all share is like, how do you make something real? Because one of the challenges is, I think everybody, you know, if you take all the CEO talking heads and you take all what we say, of which probably most people are like, oh, whatever, what CEOs talk about. We all pretty much say the same thing. I mean, if you just, you know, put it all into a word machine, you know, we're all saying people first. We're all saying these things about authentic. And we're saying the, the big opportunity is what are you, what are you actually doing? And, and mm -hmm. how do the, your actions back that up? So mm -hmm. a, a quick story, I would just say, and it's not to brag, it's just a reality of what we did. And, in uh, when COVID hit, you know, it was, uh, you know, the World Health Organization, I don't have to remind everybody on March 11th, Wednesday of 2020, declared the global pandemic. You know, we, we were like, um, we brought together a group on Friday the 13th and a cross-functional leadership team to say, oh, oh, this, this seems serious, I don't know. <laughs> but it was like, we sat there and we decided it was like, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to take care of each other. We're going to take care of our customers and we're going to take care of the community. I don't know what we're facing, but we're going to think of those three things. And with those three things, we're going to um, let's make the best decisions we can so that we can feel that we're um, in six months or a year from now, you know, I think we we're optimistic um, mm -hmm. that we'll be proud of those decisions. So we just jumped right in and uh, you know, and within that, um, we were doing things like everybody else. Like we were tuning into our governor, the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, he was on at two o'clock every day and we'd have a, the team around there and he'd be like, okay, um, employees need, employers need to take people's temperatures. So we're all looking around the rooms like, they may have thermometers, like, you know, and we're trying to find those. And we just figured those things out. Mm -hmm. In April of 2020, we were off 80%. Our business... Mm -hmm fundamentally stopped. We had days where we were not only didn't have orders, we were negative because of canceled orders. And so we were, we were looking at things and, and here's what, here's what I knew. And, and we felt very confident about KFC, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, Wendy's, they were not going to go out of business. Mm -hmm. They would thrive again. What I didn't know is how long, and so we just went and started building bridges to take care of, of mm -hmm. our people. And we, we ended up the year 
down about 20%. But what we made a conscious decision about was we did not lay off anyone. We did not cut anyone's compensation. We did not cut any benefits. Um, there were days when our production was, we were producing three days a week and we were not producing two days a week and we sent folks home and where they were still getting paid. We felt we could do that. We didn't know how long we could do it, but we were building what we called bridges to when we would thrive mm-hmm. again. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we came out of 2020 and we were prepared. We mm-hmm. were ready for people to thrive and our business took off. And most of our competitors were such that they had laid off, they couldn't gear up. And so... Our business today went in 2020, we were doing a little over 200 million. And, and the year we just finished 2022, we did uh, a right about 400 million. And so it was, and we, we took care of, we took a long view. We took care of our people Um, within it. We took care of our community. Like on Mm -hmm. good Friday of 2020, we were the, we were closed for production, but we opened up our campus and supported Uh, a mass food distribution with the Dayton Mm -hmm. Food Bank and had uh, hundreds of people come through. Mm -hmm. We determined that in in, uh, April that our supply chain folks had bought a lot of uh, N95, KN95 masks. Uh We had 10,000 of them. And we were immediately like, we're giving those to the hospitals. So we took them around to the major hospital systems, to Dayton Children's, to what is uh, the two major hospitals and, and just gave it to them. And Mm -hmm. they were just blown away. But for us, it was just like, well, we shouldn't use them. They need them. And it was just, and again, I'm not saying this to uh, brag. It was Mm -hmm. just trying to do what we um, just trying to do what we said we were going to do. And that's Mm -hmm. how do we take care of each other? How do we take care Mm -hmm. of our people? How do Mm -hmm. we take care of the community? So I'll stop rambling. (laughs) No, it's, you know, I love when, when, you know, business leaders share their own personal stories of what they did, you know, um, how, how they're doing the right thing, how they personally feel what's right, you know, kind of pivoting to everybody pivoted in some way, shape or form, right? So you were, I love that you just shared certain examples of how that happened. And it's really amazing that um, you were hopeful, you were looking at, let's say two years from now, knowing that your customers aren't going to close down. They might not be able to have people inside, but it doesn't mean the drive-through isn't open, right? So they're still like producing and making things. It just slowed down a little bit for you. So knowing those things were going to happen, um, you knew that your employees were still going to um, be needed in, at some point um, the way they were pre-COVID. So thank you for sharing that. That was that was really, and I, that's amazing. And I think it was just knowing like we've had lots of crises and it's kind Mm -hmm. of like they follow the same arc of like, you know, you kind of don't believe it. And then, you know, it goes through all the different stages. And so I knew this would be like, you know, like it would eventually be at a place where it would be normal again, whatever that was, just Mm -hmm. didn't know how long. So Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was um, just trying to be there and be an anchor for people to provide some Mm -hmm. sanity within it all. I would say the other ones just quickly on our values is, you know, like we believe strongly in like, you know, what's it mean to be a best place to work and grow and how are you involved? Like we believe relationships matter and uh, we think that's a critical part of, um, of, of being a best place to work. So as an example, we, um, and we say that this relationships matter with our customers, with our employees with our suppliers uh you know one of the things we 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 talk about is we we're very intentional about not hiring jerks um Mm -hmm. and and you know some places will hire a jerk if they're really good you know to to us it's like who wants to work with a jerk like (laughs) you know that's that is not a great place if you're working with jerks and and we don't feel like you know if somebody's a jerk it's like yeah they're not that good and so we're, um, you know, making sure and trying to make sure people mm-hmm. understand, you know, being respectful and, and mm-hmm. being professional and, and caring about people mm-hmm. is, is important to be here. And if you're mm-hmm. not, uh, we're not going to be there. 
Mm -hmm. um, you won't fit. You eventually won't fit in, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, if you um, so, through, we're going to find you. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, there's one piece that I really wanted to focus on because I know a lot of people were interested in having a conversation with you at the summit. So I know Henny Penny became an employee owned company in 2015. So an ESOP. Can yeah. you share more about that transition and what went into making that decision and the impact of it? Yeah. So um, look at that picture. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, we announced it at that time. We were about, uh, I think, around 600 people. Um, and this was in the local auditorium of the high school. It was uh, January 8th, 2015. Uh, we had technically become uh, employee owned on December 30th, 2014, but announced it to all employees. And I would say most didn't even know, you know, it was like, the 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 person who made this possible was Steve Cobb, who's an amazing man. Uh, he's been to Conscious Capitalism. I, mm -hmm. uh, we went together for the um, uh, one of the CEO uh, summits, but it was his gift, and it's a gift to the employees, mm -hmm. community, and um, our customers. And, and really what he was trying to do is he was a second generation owner. He had grown and, and it was uh, the values that we have of being a long view and valuing relationships and, and trust being at the core of who we are were values of Steve and the Cobb family for. And, and so he was just trying to figure out well, when I'm gone, he wasn't trying to get out. He wasn't trying for a liquidity event uh, just to, he was just thinking and spending time going, uh, this was so impactful to me and my family. This has been so impactful to this area mm -hmm. and the families that have worked here. And, and it's been so impactful to the community. How can I try to keep this going? So, um, because we all have examples of where companies were something very special in a community and then they were sold and they, they went away uh, or mm -hmm. what they were went away. They became something uh, very different. And so that's what he was focused on. And, and through that process, we came across the employee owned, uh, the employee owned concept and we didn't know much about it. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are like, don't know much about it. You hear good stories and bad stories mm -hmm. about ESOPs. Typically the bad story is this. Some guy owns a company. He wants to get out and he can't sell it to anybody. So he sticks it to his employees. <laughs> and it's like an <laughs> overpriced thing that gets to the employees and it's just not a good deal. And so, but, but really it's a, it's a really, um, really special thing. And we could spend, I could spend uh, a lot of time, mm -hmm. you know, I talk too much anyway, but I could talk all day about ESOPs <laughs> and, and there, there, there's a lot of aspects to it. And mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time with um, company uh, leadership uh, as they might think about an ESOP mm -hmm. and they're not for everybody, but mm -hmm. in, in circumstances, they are very compelling. And so I enjoy mm -hmm. that. And as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. I would say, um, any any people that want to reach out and are considering it want to know more because I believe it's uh, it it in the right circumstance is a really compelling form of capitalism and it's mm -hmm. it's capitalism not at its best well I'd say it's its best but it's it's not the <laughs> only way but it 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 brings in all the elements of capitalism mm -hmm. and it also gets into where everybody in your organization can participate mm -hmm. in a meaningful way in the, um, as a company becomes more valuable, the, the sharing of that with all. So mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, it was done in 2015. I'd say when it happened, uh, you know, most people didn't even know what it meant. You know, Steve was mm -hmm. like, ah, and I've sold the company to all of you. And everybody's like, <laughs> what? What, is, what does that mean? Right. And what does, what does not that mean? mean? So it's an mm -hmm. ongoing educational process and, mm -hmm. And there's this ownership opportunity of what it means as far as your opportunities, but it's also your responsibilities and what's your responsibility mm -hmm. for um, how, uh, how we do and how we perform and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very exciting. It's very cool. And um, whether it's the mechanics 
or how we're doing our ESOP or whatever, it's it's a whole couple day topic. <laughs> right, right. I mean, that's the thing. It's such a it's such an elongated process already, and understanding each employee understanding that they own an equal part of the company is is confusing because they're like, what does that mean? I don't know you know, how do I engage? And so, um, yeah, but we do have a deep dive scheduled with yep. you for our senior leader yep. network members. So we can actually dive in to that topic more once we, um, once we have that deep dive next month. Um, yeah. but, uh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And that, that other topic, you brought something up as you were speaking about, um, you know, being employee owned, where you were building Henny Penny to be a company that will continue to thrive and, and, and find success long after you've given up your leadership role. So yeah. kind of like the naming it um, Henny Penny to infinity. So, you know, what advice do you have for other CEOs and senior leaders that are trying to create succession plans and build companies that will endure after their tenure is up? Yeah. Um, I might set it up by going back a couple of slides to where we were at the values. I just want to set up a little bit more of the discussion about the long view. And the long view, I think, uh, you know, first of all, I just want to encourage people that are in a situation where they can to consider um, how the long view can really impact your culture and and what we um, how we look at it. And I would say the long view I, or, or already talked about, and this isn't whether you're employee owned or not. It's just kind of like having a long view. Now, within this long view, I would I would start with this. Some people's businesses aren't inclined to be in a place where they they are doing a long view, and that's okay. I'm not saying it's for everyone. As an as an example, if you were um, in the the residential real estate and you were a house flipper, and I don't mean that in a bad way, you you don't really have a long view of that. You would not invest in things that there would be no return for it if you're planning to do this to a house and then flip it. And there are there are really quality flippers and there's ones that aren't. But I would just say, if your business is such that you it doesn't make sense to have a long view, then I understand that. I also understand if you're in a kind of like survival mode and you're just, got like 30 days of cash or you're in a place where you're just trying to survive, you will not have the luxury of a long view. But mm -hmm. what I would say is if you can position yourself in the long view, it is very powerful. And I would say that's where we try to have this long view. And within that long view, you get things like, um, here's, here's the dynamic that I would say different. If you have a long view, um, Again, it's almost like if you had your house flipper, if you have your house and you're going to be there for the next 30 years, you probably will do things that would last and be more invested because you're going to be there to take advantage of it and mm -hmm. use it. For us, it'd be, well, the long view helps us as far as making sure we're taking care of our people and not making them as far as the layoffs. Mm -hmm. But I would also say, you know, it's how we look at, let's say, our suppliers. You know, some people might look to say, gosh, we're going to put the screws to our suppliers. Um, and if you just have a short view, that might be all you need to think about. For us, if you have a long view, it's like, well, we want our, we want our suppliers to thrive. We mm -hmm. want them to be vibrant. What If you just put the screws to your suppliers and next year they go out of business, then what? You know, so if you're saying like, and and within the long view, we we're we're investing. You know, we're investing deeply in our 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 facilities. You know, we're um, we yeah. You'll see the picture here with the last four years investing. Right. In, so yeah, you know, yeah, you, if you weren't done planning to be around, so we want to develop our people. We want to help them be um, whether they're here or not. We want to invest in them. We. We invested in a, an innovation. The incubator is where we do a lot of our engineering innovation. Um, we the great minds come together. <laughs> yes, exactly. And where we, um, um, it's funny because some of, we named it the incubator, you know, kind of where you incubate ideas and, and again, kind of off the chicken OT a little bit. <laughs> so some of our old line engineers were like, you know, the incubator doesn't have the gravitas. And I was like, you work for Henny Penny. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> how did that not, how did you get past that? What do but, you mean? <laughs> but, but, you know, we're, we're making these investments. Mm -hmm. We, we just, um, 
um, opened an office in downtown Dayton where mm -hmm. there is a lot of uh, activity, um, a lot happening in the urban core, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of excitement, energy. There's also mm -hmm. a big amount of um, software development happening because mm -hmm. in Dayton, we have Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is one of the largest Air Force bases in the world. And there is a huge amount of um, software development that is you know, for base work. And there are a lot of these uh, early stage um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, companies are downtown. So we we tapped in because we were looking, we need talent that would be electrical engineers, software developer. Mm. So we're trying to expand and make investments on right. how we can continue mm -hmm. to get the talent we need in order to continue to thrive and perform. Right. Um, that's great. Just, you always focus on quality. And I, you know, I think that's just important to keep at the front of, you know, of mind. Um, quality investments, um, you know, investing in your people like you see here. Um, it's just, you know, so that you've developed them as your successors in whatever role they, that may be, right? Yeah. So I, you know, thank you for all your stories. I want to, we do have a few questions. So I want to save some space um, for okay. you to answer some of I'll, our questions from our audience. And, and I'll come back at some point maybe to talk about, this is what I was, you know, just thinking about how do companies endure and not employee owned companies, just why do companies, how have they endured and why companies failed? And within this, I've been working on areas of like, number one reason for a company to not be here anymore is performance. Like they just, like Blockbuster, they just fail to remain relevant. So performance is one thing that you've got to pay very big attention and you're not going to make it if you don't have that. The other is succession, leadership succession, the CEO, the board, and the last one mm -hmm. is stewardship. And that's just mm -hmm. that maybe people just sold out. And I know there's some companies out there that are like, uh, they weren't, they weren't trying to be create Apple. They wanted to be bought by Apple. But I'd say mm -hmm. uh, we're in a mode of trying to make this kind of an institution for the community. And how can the good we're doing continue on? And whether it's the right words or like, I'm, I'm just thinking like, how do we make this forever and beyond? Right. So forever I'll... and beyond. <laughs> yes. I love that. I'm going to take a question from the audience um, here. And I know you you kind of alluded to it, but from Diane, how do you measure the best place to work and grow? I know you had mentioned meaningful relationships, um, but can you expand on yeah. that? Um, you know, so we have lots of different things that we try. And I'd say it's 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 a challenge to actually have these metrics. I would say, as an example, this is anecdotally, and it's something we're we're tracking, but to me, it's a really powerful indicator. And it's like, we've grown a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, one is, um, we have grown a lot of employees that came here because they have friends here. And I would say, you know, normally, if you bring a friend to a company, that means you're, you, you, you're pretty happy with that company and you're excited about that company. Because if, if you're not, if you think it's a, a toxic place, if you think it's going in the wrong direction, if you don't like it, you know, you're more than likely if your friend would say, Hey, how are things there? You'd be like, do you know any place? Like right. the last thing I want to do is bring a friend in here and, and whatever. So not like it. I would say a big thing that um, one of the things besides we're, you know, we've gone through different engagement uh, um, surveys. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I, I, I felt like any of them are particularly great. Mm -hmm. um, not that mm -hmm. they're that, you know, that, that, that have worked for us, you know, mm -hmm. we're in a unique environment too. We're, our, we're a manufacturer. So we've got, yeah. we've got a split group of folks mm -hmm. that are just starting and in, in hourly to, and so anyway, finding mm -hmm. ones that benchmark across that we're still looking, but I would say mm -hmm. uh turnover, I would say uh referrals for employees um, to me have been the most meaningful indication of things going right. Um, mm -hmm. Like you said, you know, it's a learning process and measuring is kind of like a trial and error basis, right? So understanding and surveying your employees um, in different ways. Um, so once you, you know, once you have those measurements, you know, let me know and then I can help kind of compile those metrics and share those with our community as well. Um, 
But to actually add on to that question, um, there are a couple of questions here about don't hire jerks, right? So yeah. there, you know, you don't want to staff up too rapidly, um, as Chris Schaefer had mentioned, but we also have some uh, a question by John. So you don't want to hire jerks, but sometimes they just kind of they're there. You don't know them through the interview process. What are how are these principles built into your systems? Like how do you actually not hire these jerks? Yeah. Well, um, you know, hiring is complicated anyway. And I would I would probably be in the camp of, you know, it's like innovation is hard. So anybody who says they figured it out, you know, like, okay, they're in their the throes of losing it. Um, you know, us figuring out hiring. Um, but I would say what we do is we we have a pretty involved interview process. And so when you come in, you're meeting with not just the hiring manager, you're meeting with and you're having panel discussions. And they're not meant to be just like you being grilled, but there is discussion and you might be with five different people at that mm -hmm. time, a couple of different times. And so within that, we found it to be a pretty effective way to kind of, you know, because some people are kind of observing come, and some people have different radar as far as the, mm -hmm. fit, the feel. So we, um, the trick is, is kind of the, you know, the, the feel and fit about somebody. We do the normal stuff too. Like, I mean, our, our bells go up immediately if somebody is like rude to a receptionist or, or something where there's a lot of people that feel comfortable kind of weighing in on somebody. <laughs> and I think over time and, and we do references and we'll typically try to get references for people that aren't just who they referred to, but, you know, other things. And so we're, we spend a lot of time on the fit. Um, mm -hmm. And those are just some of the things. Conversations. And, yeah. and I think it's helped, but again, you, you know, people can fool people. You could say, gosh, that person's yeah. great. And then you, you know, you read, they kick their dog at their house, you know, you're like, how does that <laughs> But Let's people start revealing themselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Rob. That's that's I mean, it, it's important, you know, the interview process and having them, you know, um, start the relationships with who they'll be working with. So like you said, there are certain people who have different radars. So that's one way of doing it. And then eventually it, you know, true colors come out anyway. So um, they wouldn't last. Right. Um, so there's a couple more questions. I know we have, we're almost at time, but I wanted to get these in uh, from Corey Blake. Um, curious if you saw a shift in employee relationships to your core values after employee ownership was established. Uh, that's a good one, Corey. Um, it's, I would say the, the big thing was kind of what we call own it. And I think the values of, you know, being a, a, a great place to work, being a place that had a long view, had a place where you develop trust with each other, you do what you say, and, and, and if not, you, you, you raise your hand and whatever. Those were deep in our, our, ourselves. I think the opportunities of what's taking us to a whole nother place is this, um, this reality of the better we do, the better we all do. And that's mm -hmm. part of the employee owned part. And so, yeah. you know, when I would say, what are some examples? And this isn't a bad thing about where we were. It's just the reality. You know, uh, right now, all of our employees that are employee owners, um, you know, they get a statement every year and they get shares. And and so if we add up the shares, uh, the, the statement values that we just provided to everybody like glass fall, which had their latest distribution and share price. There's, you know, close to $80 million of value in our employees' hands. It's, and it's not like, uh, it's not like geared to like just the senior management or something. This is mm -hmm. throughout the company. And those are things that it's like, there are meaningful um, financial impacts that are happening because the better we do, the better we all do. I would say as an example, in 2020, when I talked about what, what happened when we were 20% off and every year we have a company performance bonus and we'll have it in, in for 2020, we had an, uh, a bonus. And I would say there probably weren't very many people that could were off 20% and mm -hmm. paid a bonus 
to all their employees. Um, besides the fact that we didn't lay anybody off and we didn't have anybody's right. compensation affected. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not, again, saying that to brag. I'm just saying that was possible because of our mm -hmm. structure about being employee owned, which separated it. So I'd say things are accelerating, but it wasn't like there was this total shift of how we are. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, this is going to be a yes or no question because I know it was in the beginning of the uh, the Q and A. But is Henny Penny involved in the National Center for Employee Ownership, the NCEO? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now you know I can't ever <laughs> answer it with one question. Uh, <laughs> I'll okay, just go, with, I'll go with what you said. No, yes, we are. We're we're involved okay. with a, a, a number of different ESOP organizations, of which that one we are. Wonderful. Thank you. So we are a little over the close at or the end of our session and just wanted to thank you, all of you, for joining us today. Immense gratitude to you, Rob, for your passion, your stories. Uh, always love having a conversation with you and such informative and insightful uh, you know, information um, and what it really means to be a long view uh, and what approach that is and how to do those in, in certain examples um, to have a business for infinity. So really appreciate your time, your energy, your leadership, and to be able to share these unique business approaches to make Kenny Penny as successful as it is today. Um, so next time everybody goes to, you know, a, a nice fast food restaurant, they'll be like, oh, I, you know, <laughs> Where, that, where that's from. Um, Great. So this is for our Great. audience to help the CCI team to continue to improve our programming. Please fill out the brief, brief survey uh, provided in the chat. And if you'd like to learn more about Conscious Capitalism, the movement, the organization, the Senior Leader Network, our partners, um, please visit www.consciouscapitalism.org and wishing you all a wonderful rest of your week and a great day. Thank you so much, Rob. Thanks, Queenie.